recording now. Um, if you have any questions, please uh, put them into the Q&A inside of this webinar, as well as being able to email them to the homeless education at tea.texas.gov webpage. You have until April uh, 5th to submit any questions that will be included in our frequently asked questions and be posted on the grants opportunity page. If you have any very specific questions, please feel free to reach out to your regional McKinney-Vento liaison. Good afternoon, everybody. We're just so glad that you're here um, to learn more about the 24, 25, and the next Techie competitive grant cycle. Um, we've made uh, some changes to the grant and just excited about uh, walking you through um, the program guidelines and the information today. And as Desiree shared, please do direct your information to the Q&A. Any questions that you have, we will be posting um, a Q&A uh, document in the next couple of weeks um, following uh, this presentation. So our outline for this webinar today, we're going to be reviewing the timelines for the grant, the applicant eligibility and funds that are available for this three-year competitive grant, the program guidelines, application part one and required attachments, activities and use of funds, review criteria and scoring, as well as the frequently asked questions process. And also want to alert you guys that we have an updated errata that's on the grants opportunity page um, available today. And we will be going over some of those changes when we go through this grant webinar deck. Okay, so on the grants opportunities page, you can find all of the grant components. Um, they're posted and the errata was posted today, and there is the link so that you can get to the errata. Um, please review all the documents that are included and carefully follow the instructions to complete and submit your grant application packet. This is going to include applications part one, and then there are four attachments. Uh, there is a survey for your notice of intent to apply, reviewer information form, um, as well as the eligibility list to look up what your funding is. So that's just the, the general overview. Please, uh, LEAs and ESCs, we encourage you to submit your applications as soon as possible. So the purpose of the 24-25 Techie Grant Program is to provide LEAs as well as ESCs additional capacity to provide equitable opportunities and outcomes for McKinney-Vento students so there are three components to doing this. The first part is promoting school stability. The second part is facilitating enrollment and identification. And the third part is improving student attendance and academic outcomes. The grant overview for this uh, competitive grant program is that there are individual subgrant awards that are awarded to LEAs or school districts as well as education service centers. They are awarded and selected every three years. So you do have to apply in this first subgrant cycle to be eligible for the entire three years. We are providing approximately 9.3 million in grant awards for the 24-25 grant cycle. The projected grant amounts are calculated by an estimated number of identified homeless students times $126 per student with a maximum cap of $400,000. See the attached eligibility list for projected grant amount based on LEA reported counts of homeless students in the 23-24 fall PEAMS data collection. Our Gretchen, our, our Gretchen. Our Techie Grant Timeline is found on page two in your program guidelines. Uh, throughout this webinar, we're going to have all of the page numbers for your program guidelines, so feel free to follow along um, as you are participating in this webinar. The first thing that we had is March 15th um, is the last date to submit questions to be addressed in the applicants conference and webinar, March 22nd, uh, the registration for you guys to be here. As I stated previously, April 5th, which is um, coming up, is the last day to submit your frequently asked questions to TEA. 
Um, April 16th is two due dates. You have your notice of intent to apply, which is a survey. And then you also have your reviewer information form, as well as our frequently asked questions will be po um, posted on the TEA or the TEA grants opportunity page. April 23rd is the due date for the application in the TEA Document Control Center um, by 11.59 p.m. Central Time. You can see the general and fiscal guidelines, competitive application due date and time. So there's two guideline books that you can use while you're doing this grant. It's going to be your program guidelines as well as the general and fiscal guidelines. Um, and the second part of the timeline, it goes through the review period, the beginning date of the grant, the final date to submit an amendment, and the ending date of the grant, and those can all be found in your general and fiscal guidelines, and that timeline is May through August 31st. Who is eligible to apply for the Techie grant? You, this could be a local education agency, the LEAs. This could be in a consortia with your education service center. The LEAs are required to join a shared service arrangement if your project ground amount is less than 7,500. Applicants can apply individually or part of a shared service arrangement, also known as an SSA, and applicants are not permitted to apply as both. So you have to pick to either apply as an LEA or apply in consortia with your ESC. We're going to break down the shared service arrangements. Only ESCs are allowed to act as a fiscal agent of an SSA. Each SSA must have a minimum of three member districts. There is no maximum number of member districts in the SSA. SSA member districts are required to participate for the full three-year cycle. LEAs are required to join an SSA if your grant amount is under 7,500. And the projected grant amounts are calculated by an estimated total number of identified homeless students from the 23-24 PEAM snapshot times 126 um, per student. Projected by student counts, we have received a few inquiries, um, seen an increase in the number of homeless students across the state. Eligibility was determined with that fall snapshot. Uh, the federal funding overall that TEA received for this program is slightly more than it has been in years past. However, it is now being allocated for 114,000 students. We're back to pre-COVID identification numbers, um, which is a great thing. You guys have been doing a good job of doing student identification for students experiencing homelessness. Um, but this created a, a decrease in LEA's projected grant award. This information will also be included in the FAQ that will be released on April 16th in the Grant Opportunities page. The grant eligibility list um, is the last thing on the Grants Opportunities page that you can click into. Um, I always suggest doing a control F to find your school district um, and using one word as you're doing that so that you can easily find it in the 33 page document. For the three-year grant subcycle, you're going to see a few things on the eligibility list um, from a data perspective that can be helpful for you in looking at it. You have your total economically disadvantaged count. And so if you have um, a high number of totally economically disadvantaged, this works in identification that there's going to be a portion of that of students who are economically disadvantaged are also experiencing homelessness. So that's just a way for you guys to use that and why we provide that data. Um, and those presented percentages of students who are both economically disadvantaged and homeless column gives you a good indication of what that percentage is for your school district. The Touchy Program Guidelines uh, really review and look at the detailed information for every single part of the grant component. Um, we're going to review that in this webinar, but it's also important as you're going through your copy, whether you work electronically or have it printed out um, to make notes and have ideas of how you're going to do your TETCHI program implementation and what that looks like for your ESC consortia or your LEA. Um, as you're reviewing the detailed information, there are program-specific assurances that you need to um, be cognizant of, the statutory requirements, as well as the TEA program requirements, and then the activities and use of funds. 
Uh, it's very exciting. We're excited about going over that part of it with you guys for, for how you can use your funding in this three-year grant cycle. There's also performance measures and then the scoring and review for this um, Touchy subgrant. So application part one components. Um, this is your basic introduction for your application. It's gonna include your applicant information, the certification and, and incorporation to be able to apply for the grant. If you are participating, um, the ESC is filling out the shared service arrangements and the member districts that will be involved. Identify and address needs. Include the SMART goals for your Techie program implementation, measurable progress, your project evaluation and modification, as well as statutory and program assurances, and then um, signing for the equitable access and participation in the application part one. When you are looking at the application part one components request for grant funds, um, there is a budget page. And so there's some considerations for how you'll be using the funding and the program guidelines are instrumental as you are creating this budget. So in the first part, it's gonna have payroll costs. The second part is gonna be professional and contracted services. The third part is supplies and materials. The fourth part is other operating costs. And then the last part is capital outlay. So program assurances, which you can find on pages seven and nine, we have three new program assurances um, and looking at this, it's gonna be 24, 25 and 26. So if you've applied with us before, um, these are new for you guys to consider and take a look at it. Um, we have the first one that is the applicant provides assurance that if services are provided on school grounds, the schools can use funds to provide the same service to other children and youth who are determined by the LEA to be at risk of failing in or dropping out of school. If programming does not occur on school grounds, the applicant cannot use McKinney-Vento grant funds to pay for services to at-risk housed students. So this would be if you are doing, um, for example, a tutoring program at your school district, you can tutor McKinney-Vento students as well as at-risk students. They don't all have to be identified as McKinney-Vento to receive that tutoring service. Um, this is exciting. This is a new thing that you're going to be able to do. So we are really wanting to see how you guys implement that component of it on the assurance. 25. We have, um, and this has been in place for a little over a year if you've gone through the RDA self-assessment process for monitoring. We are incorporating this in the subgrant cycle. Um, you can click on that link to review and analyze your McKinney-Vento program implementation. This is really uh, a self-assessment, a needs assessment activity, um, and we have the completion date for November 1st, 2024. And it's used to really inform your program implementation and enhancements throughout the grant period. Um, I would encourage you to take a look at it. It could help in planning as you're doing your application for this um, and really a good way to look at your program in depth um, and see what needs are in existence. The 26 is really coming from the USDE federal government. They have um, a lens on looking at reviewing district level data to provide intensive support and targeted training and technical assistance to campuses who have historically had low or zero identification of students experiencing homelessness. Really looking at also providing intensive support um, when you have the same identifier code for each of your campuses. So there could be a campus that's only identifying 100% uh, unaccompanied youth or a campus that is doing um, only doubled up. And so really looking at all of the different identification measures um, for students experiencing homelessness at that campus. Maybe there's a motel that's uh, in the attendance area for that campus, but there hasn't been any identification for McKinney-Vento, so that would be a consideration. Um, so really considering these data components as you um, approach your program implementation. The last one is looking at uh, doing really targeted training and technical assistance. If the campus has, um, with the focus on campus that have a poverty level of 30% or higher. Um, so those are three considerations and assurances uh, that you should be including and considering as you do your application. And the statutory requirement number one, 
Um, and this is the same as we've had in previous grant years. You're going to provide a description of your proposed grant activities, programs, and services, how they address the identified needs and pro promote equitable access to program services needed to improve academic outcomes, resources and systems that will be implemented to support target goals and outcomes, how progress, milestones, and observable results will be documented. So this is very much the backbone. So you could have um, five to 10 activities that you are doing to support all of the McKinney-Vento Act implementation, and you write each activity uh, towards those goals that you have for your implementation. So it's not uncommon to have an activity that would go for identification and enrollment and what your plan is for that, how many students you're going to be implementing that with. Um, another activity could be academic outcomes, um, what data you're using to support how you're going to do that, or certain personnel that you have um, for mental health or wraparound service support. So really thinking through each of those activities and including that description, um, creating the buckets for your program to then implement it um, with full fidelity. And statutory requirement number two, you're gonna reflect on the coordination and collaboration of the proposed use of funds and how it's gonna facilitate enrollment, identification and educational outcomes of homeless children and unaccompanied youth. Um, again, you're gonna see these three common buckets as you're doing the implement implementation of your McKinney-Vento program, enrollment, identification and educational outcomes. Then you're looking at how are you going to, to promote meaningful involvement of parents or guardians? Um, so that's going to be your parent and family engagement component. And then the extent to which homeless children and unaccompanied youth will be integrated into the regular education program. Statutory requirement number two. So identify the types, intensity, and coordination of services to be provided in coordination with Title I Part A reservations. Um, when looking at this, you are looking at the academic years of what was put in the set aside from Title I Part A for homeless students in the 22-23 school year, as well as in the 23-24 school year um, for this school year, which you allocated in your Title I Part A. Process to review and develop your LEA's plan for coordinating services to support eligible homeless children and unaccompanied youth using Title I Part A homeless reservations. So that's really a conversation to have um, with your Title I coordinator and looking at how you guys are using that set aside fund, how it can um, really help in your program implementation. Statutory requirement number four, you're going to provide a description of the established processes, um, developing, reviewing, revising all of your current school district's policies and procedures. Uh, we're very excited on the updates that we made to statutory requirement number four. Um, you have what the requirement is and then where you can find it in the law. There is federal McKinney-Vento specific aspects of it that are in the first part of the policies and procedures. And then it goes into the Texas code um, for like the transition assistance that we have in there, as well as the, the discipline dispute resolution process. And so I really encourage you to click on those links and become very familiar with those policies and practices and then see how you can align policies and practices in your LEA um, to support implementation of your McKinney-Vento program. So calling out these two new ones that I just mentioned, the transition assistance, as well as your truancy and discipline. Um, it's a full sweep of what we have in the state and the transition assistance kit is very, very helpful in implementing, um, yeah, transition as you have your students coming in um, for homeless as well as foster care. TEA program requirements on page 11. Um, so we've had these in place and looking at them, you have school enrollment, identification, the assessment of services that you need for each of your students in a case-by-case -case basis, your PEMS coding, your implementation of services, your McKinney-Vento programming, progress monitoring, attendance, grades, and credits, all the McKinney-Vento services that you're providing through the school district or connecting um, with community referrals, general education services, as well as special program services. 
So in looking at the requirements that are on page 12, we've highlighted number five and number six, which are new as far as this touchy subgrant. Um, we've mentioned the TEA other special population self-assessment. I'm gonna be getting to this a little bit later in the presentation to give you a little bit of an overview of what that looks like. Um, but it really is a way of doing a needs assessment or a self-assessment of your McKinney-Vento program and where it's at at the beginning part of the subgrant cycle so that you can see the growth and progress um, as you implement your McKinney-Vento program. And we did also highlight um, the data and form plan and strategy in place to support program implementation across all campuses um, and looking at the low and zero identified for a campus looking at the poverty levels for the campus, as well as looking at if a campus is only identifying with um, one PEMS code doubled up or unaccompanied youth. TEA program requirement number one, um, really looking at description of the process and procedures that are utilized to enroll, identify, and provide all three levels of TECHI program services and support for homeless children and unaccompanied youth. So this could be students that are entering and returning schools from summer or holiday break. It's always a good idea to have ongoing enrollment and identification processes throughout the school year. This could be for students that are experiencing homelessness after the school year has started. They are not currently enrolled or attending any public school. They're eligible for early childhood and or pre-K programs. So just some considerations as you're writing your activities um, for program requirement number one to include in those activities um, as your goals. For program requirement number two, this is really where you dive into the McKinney Mental Liaison role for professional development. What is your plan uh, that is currently in place to increase awareness, support enrollment, identification, and increase staff capacity to, so, to respond to the unique needs of students experiencing homelessness? In your plan, it's always a good idea to make a timeline, include your training dates, how long the training is going to be, who is trained or who will be trained. Um, is it going to be in person, virtual, recorded? What kind of opportunities are you going to provide for people that are going to be able to be there or people that may come in later during the year as we see um, staff transitions? And providing a summary of the training content, as well as an evaluation process, um, getting feedback on how successful your training is um, can really help move any program forward. This can include both external and internal professional development activities um, that you engage with your staff. Program requirement number three, this is looking at a description of how the proposed grant activities, programs, and services will address the unique academic needs and support equitable outcomes of elementary homeless children and unaccompanied youth. So you should really consider um, including a timeline, milestones, strategies, and or systems that will be utilized to implement academic progress monitoring, interventions, and services to support. So when you're thinking about this first one for attendance and engagement, um, your process for doing school of origin transportation may look completely different when you're considering an elementary student. Um, when you're looking at school of origin transportation and you're doing that best in interest conversation with the family, if they're going to be on the bus for two hours, that may not be an appropriate um, amount of time for a student to attend their school of origin if they're elementary. Um, so there's just different considerations when you're thinking about attendance and engagement uh, for students experiencing homelessness at the elementary level, uh, as well as really having inside of your activities um, on-time promotion for all grade levels and coordination of targeted services for homeless children and unaccompanied youth who have been identified and are receiving other special program services. So um, in the School of Origin Transportation, if you are doing a School of Origin Transportation and the student is dual identified as McKinney-Vento as well as special education, making sure that you're consulting their IEP if there's any travel accommodations that need to be made as you're implementing that. Um, so really having inside of your plan how you're going to address when you have a dual identified student that is special education, an English learner, gifted and talented to meet the academic needs of those students. And then really bridging and leveraging those program support services um, to give them the best possible, possible educational outcomes. Assessment interventions and scores as you go throughout the school year, um, benchmark tests that they're taking, six weeks grades that they have, 
um, discipline interventions. So if they, if you're noticing um, they're getting a lot of discipline, really touching base with that student to help support them. Tutoring services, supplemental academic programs, as well as other programs or services that you're referring um, into the community to help assist those students experiencing homelessness. So any of these can work as flags and then also other support personnel that you can work with in your school district um, to have a robust and comprehensive program to support your students. And engaging with students that are experiencing homelessness at the secondary level, um, you're looking at the same things uh, for attendance, engagement, and then also really considering truancy interventions, um, if there's attendance problems for that, and meeting with the students to ask them and figure out how you can mitigate those truancy um, problems that come on. On-time promotion, do they have enough credits to go on to the next grade level? And the coordination of targeted services for homeless children and youth, making sure that you're looking at um, every way that you can support a student and all the personnel that you can bring in to create that network of support for that student. Considerations for advanced placement and dual credit coursework. Um, there's always opportunities for every student experiencing homelessness to engage in advanced placement, dual credit coursework, or engage in electives, athletics um, that excite them and make them want to participate in school. Credit recovery or credit repair services if they don't have as many credits as they need for that on-time promotion, as well as really considering the assessment interventions and scores. Uh, discipline interventions that can help them. Their four-year cohort graduation are in your progress monitoring. Are they on track for their four-year cohort graduation? Um, what systems and practices can be put in place so that they can get back on track or stay on track? And then, of course, the ultimate goal is the graduation of all homeless students, current cohort, continuers, and early graduates um, in your program. We have a very high graduation rate across the state of Texas that usually sits between 87 and 97 or 87 and 90 percent for our students experiencing homelessness and graduation. So good job for all of you guys that have been implementing strong, strong practices. And then really looking at your post-secondary transition plan. Um, we have the McKinney-Vento requirements for that of doing your FAFSA letter and the verification and working with the financial aid office on behalf of your students experiencing homelessness as well as the opportunities for um, college and career readiness programs, CTE, uh, Perkins, different things that exist within your LEA to support post-secondary um, options while they're in secondary. And then any other programs or services that you connect them to within the community. So this is program requirement number five that we mentioned earlier. Um, this is the TEA Other Self special population self-assessment to review and analyze. Um, it is a robust thing. You're actually going to look at your program um, through a lot of different lenses and go through each part of that needs assessment. This uh, slide in particular is just what the cumulative score is after you go through the entire self-assessment process. Um, and it's a review of all the things that we've been talking about in this webinar thus far like looking at your policies and procedures and how they align with McKinney-Vento, um, really looking at the public notice of educational rights for your students, transportation and school of origin, um, post-secondary transition. And so those same themes will keep coming up um, and how you're addressing them and how you're doing your program implementation. So program requirement number five is new. And again, that will be due in November um, first, 2024, as you get your new Techie subgrant cycle started. TEA program requirement number six. Um, so this is that really looking at enhancing your data and how you are doing a data informed plan and strategy in place, in particular to support students that are experiencing homelessness across all your campuses and looking at providing that intensive and targeted training specifically to those campuses um, that you have that are not identifying any students experiencing homelessness or low identification, that, in, that also looking at 100% doubled up or 100% unaccompanied homeless youth, as well as the if you have a campus that has a poverty rate of 30% or higher. 
So activity and use of funds on page 13, we want to just call out and note some of these new opportunities that you're able to engage in. So for the advisory council, um, really you can include inside of your program a youth advisory council, getting that student voice to help um, implement a stronger program. You are able to purchase the cost of a membership in any civic or community organization. Um, we have on there hosting or sponsoring of conferences, as well as in the out-of-state travel section, we've had in there in the past attending the NACI annual conference, um, but we are also including the opportunity to attend other national conferences pertaining to youth homelessness or McKinney-Vento. Um, permission for the national conference that's not NACI must be granted from the TEA Techie office, but we encourage you to send any of those opportunities um, that you would like to attend nationwide to the homeless education inbox. Allowable activity and use of funds on page 14. Um, if you've been with us in doing the touchy sub grant cycle, these are general allowable activity and use of funds that we've had in place for many years. So you have your tutoring or supplemental or enriched instruction for students. Um, expedited evaluations of the strengths and needs of homeless children and youth including needs and eligibility for program and services, um, such as educational programs of gifted and talented, children with disabilities, as well as English learners, uh, provided under, and services provided under Title I um, of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act of 1965, or similar state or local programs that they can be engaged in. Your professional development and other activities for educators and specialized instructional support personnel that are designed to heighten the understanding and sensitivity of such personnel to the needs of homeless children and youth. Um, so this could be your bus drivers, your cafeteria services. This can be your truancy officers or counselors. There's all kinds of different components within the McKinney-Vento Act of having um, professional development or participating in those meetings that can be helpful. Um, also, an important consideration would be doing professional development for your registrars. Then you have your referral services to homeless children and use for medical, dental, mental, and other health services. This is really when you're looking at all of the community supports that you have um, to do these community referrals. It's always helpful to have a nice, robust list for your LEA specifically and what's available in your community so that they, it's on hand and you can give it to your students and families um, as you're doing that identification intake process with your students. Page 15, we have so many new things on there that we were excited um, for you guys to implement and use within your program. So we are including travel for students for in-state conferences. Um, this does not include field trips. This is really intended for a state conference. Uh, Non-employee costs for in-state conferences, non-employee travel may be funded under the grant program. Um, so this is really intended for travel for students to participate in a youth panel or presentation at an approved conference. Travel for students to participate in youth leadership forums, institute programs that are not funded by other local, state, or federal programs. Um, program interventions and supports for McKinney-Vento students who are impacted by truancy or other disciplinary action. And then we have the um, state laws that are in place to support this, as well as um, looking at the commissioner rules concerning truancy and practices for addressing the needs of students experiencing homelessness. That document is very, very helpful in creating your um, chronic, anything to do with attendance. So chronic absenteeism, truancy, um, can be really instrumental. So I highly encourage you guys to click on those links and get some ideas for your activities and program implementation, as well as program interventions and supports that assist LEAs with fulfilling the requirements of Chapter 89, the commissioner rules concerning the transition assistance for highly mobile students who are homeless or in substitute care, specifically relating to students experiencing homelessness. Um, so that transition kit is amazing. It can do um, some really awesome things for your program. I saw that firsthand when we started implementing that through COVID. Um, so highly encourage you to, to click on all of those links within the program guidelines um, and really align your activities that you're doing in that program requirement number one to make sure that you're addressing all of these needs of your students experiencing homelessness. 
And then in looking at monitoring and accountability actions and activities pertaining to students experiencing homelessness, um, special populations is included in the A through F accountability high mobility super group. Um, so you guys have an awareness of that and students experiencing homelessness are included also in the state monitoring, which is known as results driven accountability or RDA for other special populations monitoring and related self assessment. So you can really get ahead of the monitoring game by applying for this touchy sub grant. We're going to do the self assessment in the first year of the grant program. Um, so if monitoring ever comes your way, you already have your self assessment ready and you are um, ahead of the game. So I think it's all really good stuff um, in looking at how you are writing your grant application um, as well as staying informed and then also providing that within your own professional developments. It becomes a good cycle of getting a really strong McKinney Vento program um, within your LEA or within your region. So important note, anytime you see our flag on here, the underlying changes are included in the errata from this slide deck. So if it is underlined and you see that little banner at the bottom of each of these slides, um, just note that this is going to be found in the errata, not in the program guidelines. We've changed some of these. Um, and also in alignment with the Department of Education's new program requirements and how they're looking at funding and sustainability um, is really what you're going to be finding on page 15 and 16. When you're doing collaboration and coordination with other federal and state funding sources, um, as we look towards moving past ARP and doing a full program um, sustainable approach, these are other um, sources for you to be getting into contact with and considering, um, and it's federally recommended to do so. So we start off with the, the first one that's been a part of this touchy subgrant cycle for many years, the Title I Part A set aside, uh, as well as your state compensatory education. Uh, we've been talking about truancy. This really, for state comp ed, you're really looking at dropout prevention. So there's a lot of things within state comp ed within the state of Texas that can be very helpful in implementing a strong McKinney-Vento program. And then you have your IDEA Part B, Part C for services for school-aged children, programs for infants and toddlers with disabilities. Um, and then we have ESCA, you've got your Title I Part C, that's gonna be your migrant education program your Title III Part A, that's gonna be your English language acquisition. Title IV, this is gonna be your student support and academic enrichment. This can really help with post-secondary um, when you're looking at connecting and making those bridges to leverage um, where your program is gonna go. Career and technical education with Perkins, um, your CTE program, health and human services. So this can include Head Start programs, there's 179 across the state that you can get connected with to help with that um, before they start in our public education system at pre-K. Uh, migrant seasonal campus and district improvement planning process. If you're not already included in your CIP or your DIP, your campus improvement plan or the district improvement plan, it's a good idea to take a look at those to show the alignment and what you're doing within your own McKinney-Vento program that supports campus and district goals um, for good implementation for all students. And then also looking at these programs that partner with in-demand fields of study that lead to high wage, high skill and in-demand occupations that are really in alignment with um, the Perkins Career and Technical Education Act of 2006. Nationwide, there's 16 career clusters. Um, in the state of Texas, we have 14. And so there are so many opportunities within your community. And so really working with your, who's ever doing your, your Perkins or your CTE program um, can really enhance and excite students in wanting to stay in school, as well as receiving um, certificates or post-secondary tracks. Um, really exciting stuff. Really excited to see how this gets implemented across the state. And then rolling into some new program requirements that we have, um, we are going, I'm going to start from the bottom. We're going to keep the prepaid cards. Um, we're going to keep those strong internal processes and in doing your prepaid card uh, with receipts for purchases and accountability measures that must be maintained by your school district and aligned to the goals of the program needs assessment. We're, the limit for this one is going to be 5% of the annual grant budget. Um, 
really make sure that you have those strong internal controls in place and that you're just constantly following them each time that you are um, distributing a prepaid card. Um, again, as a reminder, if you are thinking about using prepaid card, using it to go towards um, school of origin or gas costs for families is a good way to think about that um, or other emergency situations that come up for your families. Um, so rolling into your certain household items related to sleeping or household hygiene, um, these are allowable expenses. So air mattresses, diapers, bedding, sleeping bags, um, linens, cleaning solution, detergent, all of these are allowable expenses under the Techie subgrant. Um, really love the Dear Colleague letter that came out from the Department of Education that has been supporting these stronger wraparound services supports that we can do to help our students experiencing homelessness. Uh, you are also going to provide assurance that if a service is provided on school grounds, the schools can use those funds to provide the same service to other children and youth who are determined by the LAA to be at risk of failing in or dropping out of school. If programming does not occur on school grounds, you cannot use McKinney-Vento funding. So this has to happen at an LEA campus in particular to be able to do that um, with students that are experiencing homelessness along with other at-risk students in doing uh, tutoring for or other intervention services um, that come up or whatever services. It could be an enrichment camp. There's lots of different ways to go with that. Educational programs and activities, including credit recovery or dual credit programs for secondary students, as well as partnering with those in-demand fields um, to high wage, high skill and in-demand occupations. Um, once you start working with CTE and really looking at that career and technical education, it's really astonishing how many certificates our students are able to receive before they even graduate from high school or dual credit programs, um, AP courses. There's just a lot of very exciting ways to look at how to use your funding to support and excite students, um, not only to stay in school, but to graduate ready to go into the workforce or into their post-secondary opportunities. Um, so I just want to note on here that we have crossed out payment for gift cards. So this is included in the errata, this new language for the prepaid card. So this is not going to be in your program guidelines. You're going to have to print out the errata in order to show that you are able to purchase um, prepaid cards with your grant funds. Um, we also have expanded in looking at um, how you're doing your, your hygiene supports and stuff is an allowable expense but we are still holding to, you can't pay for household items. In particular, this would be appliances, mattresses, furniture. And as you can see, we've marked out the bedding and linens and that's been included in the errata um, as an allowable purchase. This is new and very exciting. Um, I know as a when I was a McKinney Mental Liaison, I always wanted this to be the case. So you are now able to purchase grocery items, hygiene items, and clothing items. Um, with a limit of approximately 15%. Um, this does not have to be during a natural disaster. So we've marked out that language that's included in the errata and just wanted to share that information with you. If you are looking at any amount that is above the 15%, um, you would need to get approval from TEA. Again, to get approval from TEA, that is a quick email to the homeless education inbox. So we are gonna go into our performance measures. Um, so page 17, one through five is very similar that we've had in place of what you're going to collect data on and report to the program in your end of year report. So we have these mandatory performance measures. Um, you're gonna include the number of identified homeless children and unaccompanied youth, your attendance rates, for your homeless children and unaccompanied youth, your promotion rates for each grade level um, as they're going through, the state assessment scores for homeless children and unaccompanied youth, as well as the graduation rates for homeless children and youth, um, and in alignment with where we are going nationally and where we're going in the state of Texas. These are new Techie Grant LEA performance measures that you can find on page 17. So this is gonna include college enrollment rates, for homeless children and unaccompanied youth. Um, that's, you're gonna really need to do consideration for how you collect that data. So getting with um, any portion of your school district that does data or coming up with a survey as students are exiting um, as a senior and graduating to capture that information. 
your community and district partnership. So all of those wraparound services that you find within the community and that you are using, as well as your in-district partnerships um, that you're using. So this could be Title I, this could be special education, this could be um, emergent bilingual. So sky is the limit. We've gone over this and this is our program requirement number five. So this is RDA self-assessment score for each year of the grant. Again, that will be due in November, um, as well as your data-driven plan and strategy um, that we've gone over. So you, if you have campuses with low or zero, if you have them identifying like 100% doubled up or 100% unaccompanied youth, as well as those campuses that have a 30% poverty rate um, or higher that are receiving targeted training and technical assistance on McKinney-Vento identification and enrollment practices. So scoring and review. Um, this says page 53 and 54. This is in the other guide that I was telling you guys about. This is the general and fiscal guidelines. So this is not in the program guidelines. This is its own guideline book that you need to also be accessing. So on page 53 and 54 in the general and fiscal guidelines, this is also linked on the TEA grants opportunities page so that you can click into it. Uh, the standard review criteria for a TEA grant is uh, number one, identify and address needs. There's 10 possible points that can be awarded from your grant application for this. Um, number two is gonna be your measurable goals and progress. That's gonna be 10 possible points. Your project evaluation and modification, that's gonna be five possible points. Statutory and program requirements, um, this is the biggest part of it. It's 25 possible points. Your budget is 10 possible points. So really aligning your budget to your program activities and how you're going to be implementing your program is important. There is a total of 60 possible points. And then uh, just wanna highlight the priorities for funding that we are looking at. So this is applications that receive 70% of the 60 points available will have an additional five points awarded for those LEAs and ESCs with an economically disadvantaged percentage of 75% or higher. Again, if you're wanting to find that information, of uh, if you have uh, economically disadvantaged percentage of 75% or higher, you can find that uh, in the eligibility list that we reviewed at the very beginning of the webinar. So frequently asked questions in the competitive subgrant cycle is, um, it's a process and I just wanna make sure that you have all the information if you have questions about this grant application in particular. So you, if you have any questions, you have to submit your written or a question um, not later than Friday, April 5th at 8 p.m. to the homeless education at tea.texas.gov um, inbox. Any questions that are received after 8 p.m. will not be answered, um, just so that you know that. The frequently asked question document will be posted on Tuesday, April 16th to the TEA grants opportunity page. Um, I highly recommend printing out that timeline. If you're not gonna print out the entire program guidelines or doing a PDF of that timeline, that way you know all of the different due dates and everything that is coming up for the grant. Um, it includes this information for the FAQ process, uh, but it's also important to make sure that you're doing each part of the grant application so that you can be eligible for the funds. Notice of intent to apply. Again, that's gonna be on that timeline page as well. So it kind of works really well. I used to use it as a checklist to make sure that I had each part as I was submitting my application or if I had any questions that came up for me. The notice of intent to apply is going to be a survey. It's located on the TEA grants opportunity page. So you can click into it. It's one of the links that's provided for um, this grant. If you're looking for this grant, you will need to type out Texas Education um, for Homeless, so that way you can find it in there. Make sure that you do not submit the intent to apply any later than Tuesday, April 16th, and direct any questions that you have to the Competitive Grants Unit at competitivegrants at tea.texas.gov if you have any questions related to your notice of intent to apply for this grant. If you have any questions about filling out the application, that would come to the homeless education inbox. Reviewer information form um, is a requirement of this grant. This is also located on the TA grants opportunity page. 
Um, you are going to nominate at least three individuals to serve as reviewers for this grant competition. You can you need to submit this no later than Tuesday, April 16th, 2024. Again, if you have any questions about the notice of intent to apply or the reviewer information form, um, please direct those questions to competitivegrants at tea.texas.gov. So what happens after you submit your grant application? Um, it goes, the submission of grant application goes to our negotiators and the submission of grant planning template goes to the Homeless Education Office at tea.texas.gov. So if you are looking at how you are implementing your program and what you're doing um, and you wanna know anything about this after your grant submission and your grant negotiator, all the grant negotiators are listed within this webinar so that you can easily see um, which region you fall into and who that contact person would be. So the Techie program contact information is, um, you can contact me, Desiree Veramontes, as the Techie homeless coordinator, um, highly mobile and at-risk student programs division. Uh, any questions that you have can always be directed at our homeless education at tea.texas.gov. If you go onto our website, um, you can easily copy and paste uh, the email. Um, yeah, and that is the end of our grant webinar. Just want to thank you guys for participating. Um,